Good evening, church. I'm glad that you're with us. I want to welcome those that are watching online as well. Thank you so much for joining us for prayer and worship tonight. It seems like every time I come in the doors, uh, the groups keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, Sunday was great, wasn't it? I looked around at breakfast and uh, it looked like old times. And then both services, I think Every week I'm saying this is the best attendance we've had since COVID began. And uh, what a great group tonight. Thank you. I still want to welcome all of those that are continuing to worship online. Thank you for, uh, for watching and sharing and worshiping with us tonight. Again, I've already had a number of prayer requests turned in. If you have a prayer request, make sure in just a moment and fill out a prayer request form at, uh, that we will be able to share that. I'm thankful that you're here tonight, and also, did you get a prayer list? Everybody get a prayer list when you came in? If you didn't, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. There you go. Got one down here. Snuck in. You didn't catch him. So uh, give Donna one. She's good. She's going to share with the family. So uh, take a look. want to share a few, uh, a, a few things with you coming up. Uh, this Sunday is an important uh, Sunday. We're having a joint worship service with the Cedar Bay Baptist Church. I've talked with two of their leaders today. They are excited about coming. And they have both shared, they're going to have a big crowd here. And I, I want to be able to share, we're going to have a big crowd. So let me encourage you, come back, not only this coming Sunday morning, but be back Sunday night. They're bringing finger food. We're providing cake and ice cream and other uh, sandwiches and other things. Um, it's going to be a great time of celebration and then after church fellowship and a great time to celebrate what God is doing in the life of Dan and Cedar Bay Baptist Church. I just consider him a missionary going out from us and uh, ministering to them. It was quite obvious God had his call on Dan to be a, a full-time pastor somewhere, and I'm very thankful for the work that he's doing there. We're going to celebrate that together. And then look on the back at the many other things we have coming up, because the next Sunday we're going to have a special service where we remember uh, the ministry of Mike Adams as a deacon here. Uh, he is not currently an active deacon because uh, he doesn't live in the area. They bought a home or are building a home in North Carolina, but uh, he was the longest serving deacon uh, that was still alive at Uly Baptist Church. And uh, we have lost so many great men that have gone on to glory. Mm. Folks, they're in glory. Amen? Amen. Great generation. It just means that a new generation needs to pick up the mantle and uh, follow through because it's time for another generation to rise up. And, uh, but, but Mike Adams, we're going to have a dinner following that uh, service in which we have a special recognition time uh, for his ministry and life here. And then the next week, you can see it's potluck, bring your favorite dish. So you know what that means in a Baptist church. If you don't bring it, we starve to death. I know better than that in a Baptist church. Nobody's starving to death at Uly Baptist, that's for sure. But uh, you bring your favorite dish, it's going to be a great potluck, family night dinner, and of course business meeting as well. And we have some great business to share as well. Yes, sir, Joe. You're exactly right. Uh, this Sunday is the 6th, and then the next Sunday is the 13th. So uh, uh, if you're coming this Sunday for dinner, you're just going to get a, a fellowship and, uh, and finger food. Listen, nobody's going to go hungry at Uly Baptist. Amen. Amen. Speaking of that, we had a great March, I mean uh, February, uh, with the food pantry ministry, uh, feeding so many people, and I am thankful for those of you that worked throughout the food pantry and the closed closet ministry and helping to feed our community as well. You can see now that the pre-born offering, we're getting close to that goal. I thought it would be a year-long emphasis. We're already near $11,000 towards that $15,000 goal. 
to purchase an ultrasound machine that not only will save human life, but we are praying that with it, they are sharing eternal life with every client that comes to, uh, to see that baby, Amen. but also to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm thankful to be a part of the preborn organization and help with that. You can see that our age group ministries are up and going. Tonight, we had a, a good group back here. We, I can see uh, life in our youth department. And we are talking about uh, partnering with another youth organization to help build our youth group even more in days to come. I am thankful that we have once again reached the time that our preschool is open, our children's department is open, and our youth department. But we're needing workers, and we're already looking forward to vacation Bible school. Amen? And we went two years without uh, a regular Bible school. I'm looking forward to... Uh, Bible school this year, this summer. You can see the other announcements there. I'd like to ask Bill Harris to come and lead us in prayer. I'm going to start with one prayer request. Bill, you come on up to lead us in our opening prayer. Gary Gaskell was going to preach tonight. He was on the schedule, but he called this afternoon, and uh, Brother Gary's uh, having some kind of uh, issue. He's not feeling well. Thinks it might be his gallbladder, but he doesn't know and hadn't been to the doctor yet when I had called him late this afternoon. And I told him to get himself to the hospital. And we need to pray for Brother Gary tonight. We're going to pray for Gary. Pray for each and every person that's here tonight. Uh, Brother Bill, come and lead us in our opening prayer. If you would, let's stand together. And after Brother Bill prays, we will greet one another. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, love so much that you give us the opportunity to be here and to fellowship with our brothers and sisters, and, and we are family. And as a family, we'd like to remember Gary Gaskell and just pray, dear Lord, for healing and just pray that the doctors will uh, determine what's uh, wrong with him right now and just uh, have the treatment that he needs. But we know that you are the great physician, and no matter what it is, that you can still heal anything, even without them. Amen. So we want to remember Gary, and we want to remember uh, Larry Jones with his uh, upcoming surgery on his shoulder. Just ask, dear Lord, that uh, you have him ready to go through this uh, change or ordeal, and just pray that everything will go well, and we just ask for healing for him. Uh, we want to remember all of our uh, sick and, sick and shut-in because uh, we just want them to know that they're not forgotten, that we love them, and every chance we get, we want to remind them. Just ask, dear Lord, that as this country goes through many changes, that you give us the strength to just follow you, because that's the guiding light. We need to follow you, not the world. And we just pray for all of those that defend us at home and abroad, and we just thank you so much for everything that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'll welcome one another to Yulee Baptist Church, we'll begin our worship tonight. Sing to the King. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Join. 
we're going to start a new sermon series that I've entitled Right Living in a World That's Gone Wrong. I remember before my car accident, there was a short time that uh, I got off the streets and did something somewhat productive. Uh, I joined the Little League and uh, and I was playing Little League Baseball. I must have been maybe 10 years old, 11 years old. And of all the places, because I knew absolutely nothing about baseball or organized sports, I didn't really have any exposure to such a thing, the other kids my age were up in what was called the major division. 
So I was a big kid in the minor division with a bunch of kids maybe seven and eight years old. So they put me behind the plate as the catcher because I was a big kid compared to the little kids because the kids my age, they had been involved in some kind of organized sports and ball. I'll never forget being the catcher with little kids that didn't know any better because one kid, probably the second or third game that I ever played, pulled that bat back, swung it around, and hit me right upside the head. I remember, no, I don't really remember that much. I, I do remember looking up at the ump and said, you all right, son? Yeah, I'm great. He said, well, go on to the dugout. I was sitting in the dugout for at least a few moments before I realized I'd gone to the wrong one. I didn't know where I was. If you're like me, looking around at our world today, have you ever thought to yourself, where am I? This isn't the world that I once knew. It seems like I'm an upside down world. I was reading recently of a man who had his home broken into. The thieves that came in were armed. He was defending his home and pulled out his, his pistol and, and defended his home. He was found innocent of any charges for, for, for defending his home, but one of the, the men that had broken in his home that was injured sued the man whose home he, wrote, he broke into. Folks, that's crazy. We are now living in crazy world. And just when I think it can't get any crazier, I'll watch the news for about three minutes and turn it off. Do you feel like you're living in upside down world? Like maybe somebody swung a bat and hit you in the head and you're in the wrong dugout and you just don't know what in the world just happened. Well, that's the way I feel sometimes even when I look at the modern day church. Our churches are being filled with wrong doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. I've heard of one church that uh, not so far away uh, they brag about the fact that they don't have any doctrine. Well, the word doctrine means teaching. And when you say you go to a church that doesn't have any doctrine, that just means you're going to a church that doesn't believe anything. They don't have any teaching at all. They just come together for the rock music and the feel good. Folks, I'm telling you, when we come to church, we need to come to church so that we will know a holy God that has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ and has revealed his will in the pages of his holy word. I believe that. So in order to understand how to live right in a world that's gone wrong, we need to come to the word of God. And tonight as we begin this series, we're going to look at our first message, Living Right Requires right relationships. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Titus. We are going to begin with verse 1. Look at 1 through 4. If you would, let's stand together and I'll read these verses. As is so often in the epistles, Paul begins by introducing himself. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested or revealed his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own Son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's pray together. Father, we do come praying that you would reveal your will to us through your holy word, even tonight. 
Father, help us to see how you have called us, how you have chosen us so that we might be your servants in this world. Help us to do what your word teaches, to share the gospel, to encourage people to know the word of God and the God of the word. Father, I pray tonight that if there's someone watching, someone here tonight that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, may tonight be that opportunity that they have to receive Christ and to live for you. Father, I pray for believers. These words were written to believers so that they might know how they're to act, how they're to live. Father, help us to live in holiness and purity. Help us to live in service and commitment. And now I pray these things in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, tonight's scripture passage is from the book of Titus, which is the third of the pastoral epistles. The pastoral epistles are 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. The reason they are called pastoral is because they are addressed to two pastors. We'll learn more about these two men tonight. Timothy was the pastor at the church at Ephesus, and Titus was the pastor at the church of a little island called Crete. The reason they are called epistles is not because they are the wives of the apostles. <laughs> That's a joke. The reason they're called epistles is because they are little books or little letters. So the pastoral epistles are, are little letters to these pastors that they might know what to do. In fact, the purpose of the letter is to give instructions on matters concerning God's people, the church. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 that says, These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtst to behave thyself. <laughs> Folks, people today need to know how to behave themselves. Amen? I'm going to repeat that. That's just worth, but worth repeating. That thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself. We are living in a day when people don't know how to behave. Would you agree with that? But notice what he says. Behave thyself in the house of God. I'd go further. I'd say people not only not know, do not know how to behave themselves... Some people don't know how to behave in the house of God. Amen? I'm seeing things accepted in the house of God today. And I'm not talking about Uly Baptist Church. But I'm talking about in churches across America. That there was a time it would cause people to blush. I shared with you already that over Christmas time, there was one church a very prominent church in Chicago that had Christmas story time with a transvestite. They had a transvestite priest who dressed up like a woman and read the Christmas story to a group of children in drag. I'm going to tell you, I think that's child abuse. I know it's spiritual abuse. And I know that the scripture would say that should not be in the house of God. And so we should not be surprised that Paul's writing to Timothy and says people know how to, need to know how to behave themselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Well, he says something very similar in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. He says, for this cause cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting. You see, God places pastors in churches to set things right. Can I share with you, some people don't like that, but it's biblical. That's the job of a pastor. 
to make sure that things that are not right are set right, not by the word of the pastor, but by the word of the master. And we find that in the word of God. Titus was probably written between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. You may have a Bible at home that's called the chronological Bible in which the books are in chronological order based upon when they were written. And if you have a Bible like that, you'll find 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy in three short cha chapters. Paul deals with some important issues that I believe are still important issues today. In chapter 1, he talks about the qualifications of the leaders in the church. In chapter 2, he talks about the character of the people in the church. And in chapter 3, he talks about our conduct and behavior in front of an unbelieving world. And so tonight, as we talk about getting some things right in a world that's upside down, we need to understand God's plan. And the first thing we're going to look at tonight is who is this that is the author of this book? I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 again because this is important. Paul, a servant of God. That's the first thing. An apostle of Jesus Christ. And notice that he is a servant. He's an apostle according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. But hath in due times manifested, that word manifested means God revealed His word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Notice how he identifies himself. He identifies himself by the name Paul. Now, Paul, as we know, when he was born, was given a Hebrew name, Saul. The name Saul was the name of a king, a name of somebody of royalty, a name of somebody who ruled over others. But when he got born again, he took on the name Paul. That means the small one, the little one. You see, no longer is he Saul the king. He's now Paul the servant and the slave. This is Paul that was willing to risk his life because he was going to preach the true word of God. He was going to share the wonderful gospel that saves lives and is able to present the gospel that is able to take people to glory. When the early church said, this is from Paul, nobody said, Paul who? They knew who he was because of his character. What was it about his character? Well, the first thing we see, he calls himself the servant of God. Now, because this was written to Titus doesn't mean that it's not applicable to you and me. You see, Paul says, I'm a servant of God. That word servant is literally a slave. He says, I am God's slave. I belong to Him. And believer, if you've accepted Christ, you too need to be able to say along with Paul, I am a servant of the Lord. I'm I belong to him. I am, I am his slave. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I'm Paul who can do miracles. I'm Paul that rules over you. No, he says, I'm Paul. I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. In fact, he called himself the chief of sinners. He recognized his sinful nature. And, and said, I, I'm, not, I'm not a somebody. I'm a nobody who becomes somebody because I'm in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Listen, he, 
He said, I, I'm, I'm at the lowest rung of the ladder. He said, I am uh, the, the bottom when it comes to the pecking order. His life was dedicated to service to the Lord. But then second, after saying I'm a servant, he says, I am an apostle. Now the word apostle means to be a messenger of God. That's the most literal sense. But when we understand the broader sense of the Bible, when we think of the apostles, these are first century eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ who were serving in that early church. And Paul could identify with that because he saw the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. Amen? You may have missed it a few weeks ago. I told you I wanted to be like Paul on the road to demask us. Amen? And I am, I am thankful as I'm looking around tonight that, uh, that we're moving forward in that manner. But this is Paul who, who saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. He was an apostle. He is a messenger of Jesus Christ and was able to speak with authority, having learned from Jesus Christ in a vision. His writings were not his. He was just merely the author. It is God who is the author. He was just the one who penned the words as God gave His holy word. And so Paul was a servant who was the one who was doing the writing, but it is God's holy word that he was writing. These are the words of God. Now notice how he involves himself. First of all, as he's writing, he says, his mission is to evangelize. Did you notice that he wanted to, to be the messenger of the gospel. Listen, that needs to be our first desire. It's to see people saved. To see lives changed. Paul's utmost desire was to see people have eternal life. Eternal life means abundant life now, but it means unending life in glory. For the last two years here in Yulee, I'm often reminded of people that we've been out as a church to share the gospel, many of them that I had the opportunity to, to lead to the Lord. This past Friday, going through a graveyard, I was able to literally go to tombs of people that I know were saved here at Yuli Baptist. Oh, listen, they not only had abundant life here, but... Because they receive Jesus, they have unending life. Amen? Amen? Listen, I am thankful for the ministry of Yulee Baptist in sharing the gospel with our community. Notice what he says about this eternal life. It is experienced by faith, not good works. It's all about our faith in the Lord. It's not about what we've done. It's about what Jesus did on a rough, rugged cross. But a life given to the Lord Jesus needs to be a life that is evidenced by godly living. Notice he calls those of us that are saved the elect. We are living in a time when there are churches that will split over this word, elect or election. When I was a young child, after receiving Christ, I was confused about this word. My pastor explained election to me this way. A very simple way that he explained it. Some people today would find this disturbing. But I asked my pastor after getting saved as a young teenager, what does this word election mean? He said, Doug, this is all you need to know. The devil's voting against you. He thought he had you. But God was voting for you. Amen. And a witness shared the gospel. And you had the deciding vote. And you chose the Lord. Listen, I don't understand the doctrine of election fully, but I do know that while God is sovereign and chooses those that are to be saved, we have to choose Him as well. We have to make our commitment to the Lord. 
Some people like to diminish that. But folks, we ought never diminish the importance of every person making their own personal commitment to the Lord. Amen? Well, the believers of this gospel, those that have been elect of God, must live a godly life. We are not saved by right living. But if we really are saved, we need to be committed to live right for the Lord. I often say Christians are not sinless, but Christians ought to sin less. Amen? Amen. Edmund Herbert writes, A profession of truth which allows an individual to live in ungodliness is a spurious profession. It's one thing to say you're saved. It's another thing to truly be saved. And so every time I preach, I encourage people, look inside your heart. Are you certain that if you were to die that you would go to heaven? Do you really know the Lord? Well, second, he had a message to edify. That means to build up the church. Paul's calling was to preach the word of God. We are living in a day in which many churches are diminishing the role of preaching. They magnify teaching to the point that many pastors no longer preach from a pulpit, They sit around a table and just have a discussion. Folks, I I don't want to diminish what any other church does, but I'm going to tell you, the Bible says we are to preach the word in church. Amen? Amen? I believe that. Preaching is a public proclamation. It is different from teaching. And what is it that we are to preach? And yes, what is it we are to teach? We are to teach and preach the truth. God is truth, and he does not lie. John 14, 6, Jesus made it clear. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And because God is truth, who is revealed in Jesus Christ, his word is true. And when we live in a world that seems upside down, it is only this world that can help us to turn it right side up. Amen? If you want to know what's really going on, read the Word and know what God's Word has to say about a matter. Well, Jesus came preaching. And Paul said he's a preacher And he says here to Titus, preach the truth. Well, let's look secondly at the audience. We saw that in verse 4. Notice how he introduces Titus. First of all, he says this about the one who is the receiver of this book. He says, Titus is mine own son. That word own means that Titus is Paul's genuine son. Now, he's not his biological son, but what this means is that Paul led Titus to know Jesus. Listen, I'm thankful for the opportunity anytime I am able to be used to share the gospel and see someone come to know Christ. The word son is a word that means a legitimate son. Paul had led Titus to Christ. He also had led Timothy to Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, he says this to Timothy, My own son in the faith. Notice this about Paul that should be true about you and me. Paul was sharing the gospel. I want to repeat that. Paul was sharing the gospel. Church, me and you need to share the gospel with others. We need to share the gospel when we're at church, when we're in Sunday school. But we need to share the gospel when we're not here at church, but out in the world sharing the gospel with others. That was the role, not only of Paul and Timothy and Titus. Folks, that's your role and my role as well, to share the gospel. And notice this second, after the common faith. In other words... There is a commonality in faith. And how is it that we're able to have a common faith? The answer is simple, that we come to this word. 
Anytime there is an argument in church, we should break out in Bible study. Amen? Amen. You see, when we're having an argument, we may be arguing about what we think. In truth, in church, we ought to say, you know what, let's get together and find out what God thinks. And that should settle the matter. Notice how he greets Titus. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you. I like those three words. Grace is getting what I don't deserve. I'm thankful that God gave me his love that I don't deserve. I'm thankful that he offers his love to every person, even though we don't deserve it. I'm thankful that his word says, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I'm thankful that God loves you. And if you're here tonight, you're watching, listen closely, God loves you. He doesn't love our son, but he loves us. In spite of our sinfulness, grace means that we get what we don't deserve. But mercy, that's a different word. (laughs) That means we don't get what we do deserve. What is it that we deserve? The wages of sin is death. We deserve punishment for our sin. We deserve to be separated from God. We deserve hell itself. But because of God's mercy... We don't get what we do deserve. We get mercy. We all needed mercy. Amen? I'm thankful that we have His grace. But I'm also thankful for His mercy. And then finally, notice He says peace. Peace. The peace of God that the world cannot understand. A peace in the midst of turmoil in a world that's gone crazy. Although I have explained this many times, it can't be said too often that grace is the way of salvation, but peace is the work of salvation. And you will never know the peace of God until you've made peace with God by receiving His grace and His mercy. They are one. Well, let me conclude and wrap this up. Because I've enjoyed this preaching and I could go on for another hour, but I need to wrap it up. One of the main themes of all of these pastoral epistles is the importance of the Word of God, the Bible. You see, we are to study the Bible. We are to preach the Bible. We are to teach the Bible. And we are to obey this Word. It is the Word of God that points people to Jesus. And it is the same Word of God that grows believers into service. Dr. Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, The local church ought to be a Bible institute where the Word of God is taught systematically and in a practical way. What I know is this. We need to know the Word of God. But we must know the God of the Word to be saved. 1 John chapter 5, 13. It's at the end of the Bible, right next to the book of Revelation. As God is wrapping up His Holy Word, He says this in 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you know for certain you have eternal life? I hope so. If not, the good news is, is you can receive Christ tonight. You might be watching over the internet. I've got good news. You can ask Christ to forgive you of every sin. You can ask Jesus to come into your heart. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit and you can know that you have eternal life, an abundant life here and a never-ending life in glory. You can ask Jesus in your heart right now. Would you pray?
Would you ask Christ into your heart? Believer, would you be committed to live for the Lord? Let's pray together. Father, I do pray tonight that if there's someone that needs to receive Christ in their heart, Father, I pray that tonight would be that night. Father, there may be someone who needs to pray a prayer like this. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner and need forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died for my sin on a rough, rugged cross and that he was raised from the grave for my sin. I invite Jesus to come into my heart and life. God, I trust you with all my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive Jesus and want to live for you the rest of my life. Help me to do that. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, you may be a believer. You need to recommit your life to the things that we've talked about here tonight. To live like the elect that God has chosen. To live separate and holy life. To share the gospel with others. To serve the Lord. Father, I pray during this invitation that if there's someone here that needs to make a commitment, Father, I pray the moment we stand to sing, they would step out and come. And I pray this in the wonderful